Well, my name is Michael Fueling. I'm the lead pastor here at the Village Church. And before we jump into our series, can I just take a minute? If you are a veteran and you have served in our military in any way, would you just stand for a moment? We'd love to just uh, say thank you and give you a round of applause. So stand if you have served at all in our <laughs> services. Thank you, and my mom and dad are here. So again, I say this, my dad served in the military, but if you ever want the dirt on me, the worst of the worst, they've got all of it. They'll be here after the service for your interrogating pleasure. Uh, welcome to week three of our five-week series on heaven and hell. I've got great news for you. We are not talking about hell today. I tried to get it all into one week, so you're welcome on that one. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he was given a vision by God, and in the vision, he had the privilege to see heaven. And he talks about it in 1 Corinthians, and he talks about going to the third heaven. The first heaven in Jewish thought is basically the clouds, etc. The second heaven would be the stars and the cosmos. And then the third heaven would be the place where God dwells. And so he was given this really incredible gift. And, and it was interesting, it's interesting reading his writings after this because when you read his writings and you look at the story of his life, there is, I think what, what many would look at as a reckless style of living. He is so devoted to building the kingdom of God, even willing to sacrifice his body in ways that most people would be petrified to do because what he saw so changed his understanding of what this world really had to offer. As you start reading through his letters, you start to see that he's kind of got this different view of eternity than I think most people have. Probably a perk and privilege of receiving a vision where you actually see the realities of the third heaven. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, here's what he says. He says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Could we all agree for a moment that the Apostle Paul suffered a lot? Uh, people tried to kill him multiple times. He was stoned. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. I mean, eventually he was actually killed because of his belief in Jesus Christ. And I mean, if anybody knew suffering, this guy knew suffering. He knew emotional suffering, physical suffering, relational suffering, spiritual suffering. In fact, because of the vision that he was given of the third heaven to keep him from getting arrogant, and we've talked about this in our Heaven and Hell and, and Spiritual War series, that God gave him a thorn in his flesh. Some kind of demon, it appears, that was allowed to torment him. We don't know if it was physical or emotional or some combination of the both. But this guy knew suffering. And, and when he got a vision into the eternal world, he said, whatever you go through here, it will be made up to you so far beyond anything you could possibly imagine. In one of my, my favorite passages, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, he says, No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So when you think of heaven, and eternity, by default, most people have the following scenario in your brain. You are a 24-7 disembodied spirit who is forced to sing and to worship Jesus 24-7 for eternity future. And for some of you, as you hear that, that's your hell. I watch you when you worship. You're like, not interested. Like, I like the words. I like the way they sound. I like the melody. I like the band. I mean it. I appreciate it. But doggone it, you hand raisers, you're weird. And if you expect me to sit for all of eternity and dance and sing and raise my hand, not happening. You know exactly who you are. I'm not judging your worship. I'm just saying the last thing you want to do is dance and sing. Some of you, you hear that and you are like musical to the core of you. And you're like, yes, I have really good news actually for everybody. That is not what scripture teaches. In fact, what scripture teaches is that you will be resurrected bodily and physically, the spiritual and the physical converged. Now, I gotta just tell you on the front end, it is, it is killing me not to jump into other subjects. So let me just plot through like what we're gonna talk about the next three weeks. And so this week, we are gonna be talking about exclusively the new earth. What is it like? What can you expect? What's it gonna be? What's gonna be there? Next week, we're going to talk about resurrection bodies. 
What is it like to actually have a body that is resurrected? And, and we're gonna root our brains in scripture. And then, as we say, use some holy imagination. And then we're gonna look at what is life like in resurrected bodies on the new earth. And, and I'm gonna try really, really hard to not jump into those categories, but you're gonna see I dabble every, every once in, in a while. I want you to turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Put this on the screen for you. Here's what Peter says. He says, according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So as we think about the new creation, there are two sides of the coin here. You have the new heavens and you have the new earth. And I want to be really clear. The new heavens is not the place where God dwells. He's talking about the sky and the stars and the cosmos. That's the new heavens. And so at the end of history, there is going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And what I want to do is just jump into some of this. And so first, just let's explore for a minute the magnitude and the beauty of the current heavens. In fact, scientists have given, I think, a really funny name to this whole area outside of earth. They call it space. Which to me, I'm like, what do, we, what do we call all of this? Well, there's a lot of space. Maybe we should call it outer space. Like, what, what do we call this space? Let's call this space space. It's a very weird term, but it's just all space. And the more you get to know what's happening out there, you realize it is so, so vast. Now, here are uh, some units of measure that I find just so intriguing that it's so vast, it is so spacious that our normal units of measure cannot even be used very well. The first unit of measure is what's called an astronomical unit. And an astron astronomical unit is uh, just a measly 93 million miles. And when you're talking about our solar system, generally our solar system is going to be measured in astronomical units. But you get to this next unit, and it's what's called a light year. I don't know if you know how actually like, big a light year is, but it's six trillion miles, which in space is like a millimeter. It's like nothing. Um, then there's a, a bigger unit of measure. It's called a parsec. A parsec is 3.26 light years. Andromeda, which is our closest galaxy, is about 778,220 parsecs away. Uh, when you're talking space, though, this doesn't even begin to get you what you need in terms of quantifying distance. So then you have a megaparsec, which is one million parsecs. And then, in case you were wondering, there's a gigaparsec, which is one billion parsecs. And I thought, for fun, I would show this to you in miles, and here's what it looks like. <laughs> it's 192 plus, I think it's 21. One, two, three, four, five, six, 21 zeros, in case you're, you're listening on a podcast. The human brain can't even comprehend this. Let's consider for a moment the quantity of stars. Here's the Milky Way galaxy. In our galaxy, there are about 100 billion stars, and each of these stars has, on average, about one planet. As you pull back, uh, the best scientists can figure out is, is there are one to, one to 200 billion galaxies that are observable. Some have even hypothesized there might be upwards of a trillion galaxies in the universe. Our brain cannot even process this sort of distance. So I was, I was bored, and I thought I would ask Google, uh, Google, what percentage of space is empty? And here's what Google said, 99.999999979 to it, meaning the vast majority of what we know of space is just empty, empty space. So I was reading on NASA's website. I thought this was so interesting. I was curious, what is, what is this matter made of? Anybody else go on like rabbit trails like this online? Am I the only one? All right, good. This is what they wrote. We know 80% of matter is actually dark matter. In reality, most of this matter consists not of hydrogen atoms, but rather of a type of matter which cosmolo cosmologists don't yet understand. Let me translate. 80% of all the matter in the universe, we don't even know what it is. We don't even know how, what to do with it or what it's made of, so we call it dark matter. So I went deeper into my rabbit hole, and I asked the question, what if you took all the matter in the cosmos and you put it all together, how big would it be? And all the matter of the universe would fit into a cube that is approximately 1,000 light years on all six sides. That's a lot, by the way. 
And, and at some point, like your brain just explodes. I wanted to show you that like YouTube video, you know, where they take you out from like the human eye and they go out in all the world and you start to see all the size of the universe and they, they hypothesize, is it a multiverse? You know, all that fun stuff. Decided not to do that. Thought it'd be a little cliche because you've all seen it. But it all reminds me of Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. And all of this is just the broken version of the heavens given over to death. Can you imagine the renewed recreation of the heavens? Let's look again at 2 Peter 3.13. Peter says, according to his promise, we're awaiting for not just the new heavens, but a new earth in which righteousness dwells. I want to take another minute. I want to just savor the beauty and intricacy of our current earth. There are an estimated 8.7 million species of animals, plants, and insects on land and sea. The vast majority have not been identified. In fact, scientists say that it would take over a thousand years to catalog all of them. In other words, only 14% of the world's species have even been identified. And in the ocean, it's estimated about only 9% have been identified. What surprises me is the next number, because um, it, apparently 99.9% .9 of all species of plants, animals, and insects are extinct which means there's been an estimated 5 billion plus extinct species of plants, animals, and insects. I'm fairly confident after the fall, some of these would probably turn on humanity, and so the Lord allowed their extinction so the human race could actually be preserved. But I'm very interested to meet a bunch of these animals. I went down another rabbit hole, just for kicks. The total insect population is estimated to be around 10 quintillion, which is 10 billion billion. I want to know, how did you count that? Like, what was the process to figure that out? <clears throat> Have you ever wondered how many ants are alive at any, any single time? I did. <laughs> the answer is 10 trillion ants are alive at any one moment in time. Take it with a grain of salt, because it might be like off by a trillion or two. Um, I would like to introduce you to a handful of extinct animals. And again, I think in order to really appreciate the possibilities of what is to come, it's really good to know what was. So some of these, in fact, most of these, I'm actually really glad are gone. So here's one. This is called a glyptodon. And it's roughly the size of a VW beetle, and it's related to armadillos. How many of you would love to meet that? <laughs> so funny. And then there is a megalodon, which is actually the biggest shark in the world. Um, it's one of the largest fish to ever exist, and it's estimated to be between 15 and 18 meters in length, 59 feet. I am so glad they're all dead, personally. How many of you would swim in the ocean if you knew that thing existed? I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch it. The Deodon, this is uh, interesting. It's an old pig, uh, but it's nicknamed Hell Pig or the Terminator Pig because it was about six feet tall. The Griffinly Megnera, this is a, a two-foot dragonfly. Titanoboa, the largest snake, 50 feet long, weighed 2,500 pounds. I just should warn you, that's not the real one. That, that's a recreation. Okay, good. Ancient giant scorpions, to torsos reached up to two meters. Mega crocodiles, 35 feet long. Some pictures I don't have. Giant otters the size of wolves. Giant beavers grow up to eight feet in length. The ground sloth weighs up to 9,000 pounds and stretches 20 feet in length. Guys, praise God they're dead. I don't want to meet any of them. This side of eternity. And this is just the tip of a massive iceberg of species that are no longer here. And what I, I just love is that God created Adam and Eve and he put them on the earth, and he said, name them. Lovingly reign over them. Subdue the earth. Make it work. Bring me glory. Collaborate with the animal kingdom and provide for your offspring. Fill the earth. 
The scriptures use the terms old and new quite a bit. And uh, what you need to know about old is that old is fine, but it's nowhere near as amazing as the new. So for example, you have the old covenant and the new covenant, which is better by far? The new covenant. And every time I mention, I, I'm not going to say my bacon joke. Okay, well, you get bacon. So like the new covenant is far better. We have the old man and the new man. And the old man is the man before Jesus who never knew Jesus. And then you meet Jesus and you have the new man and he begins to transform you. Which is better, the old man or the new man? And it's the new man is, is better. And we have the old earth and the new earth. And the old earth is filled with its own glory and majesty and amazingness. But what is going to be far, far better? It's going to be the new earth. So the biblical history of the heavens and the earth can really be broken into five chapters. I want to go through these five chapters. We're going to fly through one, one, the first four chapters, and then we're going to land on this fifth chapter for a bit longer. Chapter one, the heavens and the earth were originally created without defect. This was the place in the Garden of Eden, also called the Garden of Delight, where the physical and the spiritual were all converged into the same place where God and angels and humanity worked together, played together, talked together, worshiped together, created together, subdued creation together. And this place was awesome. In fact, it was so great that God called it very good. And this was the place where everything was supposed to, where it was as it was supposed to be. There was no animals turning on each other. There were trees and rivers and plants and animals and wildlife and sea creatures all coexisting, Tyrannosaurus Rex and big sharks and armadillos that are the size of a VW bug and, and probably billions of other species that we can't even begin to wrap our brain around. In chapter two, the earth was cursed because of our sin. And with the fall of man, there was a separation between the physical and the spiritual and what you see is that out of grace, God moved the spiritual, if you will, to heaven. He even separated the angels and demons from people. There are certain laws and rules that govern how and when they can actually interact with us. Are you grateful for that? And we find here is that they are separated out of grace because if, if you were to have full access to God right now, his glory and perfection would obliterate you with your fallen bodies. We, all, we also learn that there's a really important rule the rule goes like this, as humanity goes, so goes the earth. And so as humanity is corrupted, what always follows? Earth and creation. And as humanity is redeemed, what will inevitably follow? Earth and all of creation. Romans chapter eight, verse 20 says it this way. The creation was subjected to futility or uselessness or death. Romans 8, 21, he says, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God so that when you and I get resurrected bodies, all of creation gets renewed and sin is eradicated from it once and for all. With the fall, with the introduction of sin through Adam and Eve, death and decay are introduced all throughout creation. The beginning of the second law of thermodynamics uh, is instituted with effects such as all things tending towards chaos and disorder and the full dispersion of energy. This actually has some huge implications, one of which is eventually in billions of years, the entire cosmos will experience the big freeze where all energy and all stars and all planets is so thoroughly dissipated over such a magnitude of space that it is as cold everywhere as it could possibly be forever and ever into all eternity. Aren't you guys so grateful, by the way, that that isn't all there is for all of eternity? Not only that, by the way, if we stick around for long enough, in about three to four billion years, the sun is going to expand and eventually scorch us all to death and then consume the earth. If that weren't enough, in about four billion years, Andromeda and the Milky Way, they're on a collision course of galactic proportions. Thankfully, Jesus is going to come back before that. Chapter three, the earth is now longing and groaning for redemption. Romans eight, I think, most beautifully illustrates this. This is the chapter we're living in today. Romans eight nineteen, Paul says, the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God because it knows that once the sons of God are revealed and resurrected and made righteous as humans go, so goes creation as well. Romans 8, 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth 
until now. Groaning is a funny word. Like you could interpret that. Like when you say to your kid, clean your room, they go, Ugh. it's not the groaning. This is the groaning of a woman in labor, screaming and about to give birth. This is the pain before the anticipation. This is the pain before the blessing. And the idea here is that creation is going through something excruciating and it is groaning, but it, something very beautiful is about to be birthed. The scripture tells us that the next chapter in earth's history, which is chapter four, is that the earth will soon be dissolved by fire in judgment. Second Peter chapter three says this, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Verse 10, he says, but the day of the Lord, it will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies, that's the sun, the moon, the stars, the galaxies, they will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So for the rest of our time, we're gonna, we're gonna, savor the fifth chapter, which is yet to come. Chapter five, the heavens and the earth will be recreated in glory. So let's root our mind in God's word and use a little bit of holy imagination. What do we know that we know that the scriptures teach about the new creation? Number one, the new creation will be beyond our wildest dreams. I want to come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. And every time I do a funeral, uh, this is the passage I land on, particularly if it's a funeral of a believer. Because no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. The silliness of this first point is that the moment I even begin to try to describe it, it's already so small compared to the beauty and the reality of the real thing that will one day be. No eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. I want you to just capture in your brain for a moment the thing that brings you the greatest joy. It might be a person, an activity, it might be food, it might be an experience. I want you to grab it. Maybe it's not the one that brings you the greatest joy, but maybe it's the first thing that comes to your mind. And whatever your greatest joy is on earth, it is but a foretaste of the smallest joy in all of eternity. It will be beyond your wildest imagination, which is why Paul says, use your imagination. And whatever you imagine, it will be more glorious. Number two, the new creation will be a curseless home. Listen to the curse in Genesis chapter three. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Is anyone's job easy? No, no. I've, I've rarely met somebody who says, my job is easy all the time. If you're a farmer, you know exactly how hard this is. Thorns and thistles it shall bring for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. And because of the curse, creation works against us. We have to creatively navigate all of its obstacles. But here's what we know. On the new earth, there is going to be restoration on an atomic level. And creation will no longer push against us, but will collaborate with us as we partner with God and angels to subdue all of creation for the glory of God. There will be no thorns, no thistles, no natural disasters, no death, no decay. Creation cooperates. Wouldn't that be a huge gift? Number three, the new creation will be centered on the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem will be its capital city. It will be the largest and most glorious city anybody has ever experienced. God gave the apostle John a really precious gift. He gave him this gift almost two millennia ago. And this gift is a gift John has given to all of us. This gift was a vision of not just heaven, the spiritual place you go to before the resurrection, but also gave him a pretty clear vision of the new heavens and the new earth. Revelation chapter 21 and 22 is this beautiful description of what it's going to look like. And here's what he says in Revelation 21.10. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Here, here's what's happening. 
Do you remember the throne of God and earth were separated because of sin? And now they're coming back together. The physical and the spiritual, God and angels and humanity are being rejoined together. And the new Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel. I love this. He's like trying to figure out, I don't know how to explain this because I don't have words for it, but the best way I could describe to you is that it's like Jasper, it's clear as crystal, and it had a great high wall with 12 gates. I think, okay, how do I describe the indescribable, and how do I describe something that I don't really actually have categories this side of earth to actually describe for you? And what we find is that the new Jerusalem, it's not going to be all of the earth. It's going to be the capital of the earth. And it is going to be the place where people from all over the earth come to worship and they come to celebrate on weekly and monthly and annual rhythms. Revelation chapter 21, verse 10, he says, uh, I'm sorry, Revelation 21, 18, he says, the wall was built of jasper while the city, I love this, go figure this out, was pure gold, light clear glass. Anybody ever seen pure gold that looks like clear glass? Uh, go Google it, by the way. It's our friend for the sermon. And here's what you're going to find. Nobody knows what this is. And it, John's like, okay, it's gold, but it's clear. I don't know how to explain it to you. There seems to be different properties that work on the new earth. Once you remove, apparently, decay and sin and death on the atomic level, everything kind of shifts, and it's different. It's, it's pure gold, but it's like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophis, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Okay, how big of an oyster do they have? <laughs> let's, just, let's just be clear. Could God just make a pearl that big? Yes. That doesn't have to be an oyster. And if there is, it's even better. <laughs> Each of these gates... They're made of a single pearl. It wasn't even like putting a bunch together. And the street of the city was pure gold. And I love this line. Like transparent glass. As if that means anything to anybody this side of heaven. The new creation number four will be like the original creation, but far better. Why do we spend so much time talking about animals and the stars, etc.? Because when you understand that the new it's not totally different. There are going to be similarities, but they are just far better. In the new creation, there will be a better source of light and life. In the new creation, the sun is not giving light. Or if it is, it's inconsequential. Revelation 22.5 says, And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. When you start taking all of the passages from Isaiah and Revelation about the nature of light and emanating from the glory of God, what appears is that there are no shadows. There are, there's no place where you can be like, you can find a shadow. It's all light, all the time, everywhere you go, 24-7. No darkness, no night. And in this world, there's nothing to hide because everything is pure, exposed, good, and righteous. Uh, uh, maybe I'll give you a little bit of a glimpse. And again, we're trying to root our brains in scripture and then use some holy imagination here. Do you remember when Jesus was resurrected? I mean, not like you were there, but like in the Bible, do you remember reading that? And something weird happened. So he eats and you're like, okay, he's physical. But then he walks through a wall and you're like, but is he? I'm not gonna pretend to understand. All I'm gonna say is, when you recreate humanity on an atomic level with resurrected bodies, and you now converge the spiritual and the physical where God, angels, and humanity are all experiencing each other simultaneously, different things are possible. Like, here's a question. Can you fly into the universe and explore galaxies? Wait till the next week. Come back. We'll see. <laughs> In the new creation, there will be better relationships between animals the book of Isaiah chapter 11 talks about the millennium, but it gives you this glimpse into a picture of what the eternal world is going to look like. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb 
and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. Can we just imagine for a moment? Will you be able to take a T-Rex around? A megalodon? Hello! I'm here. Let's ride. Like a whale? Or like, a, I don't know, not a whale, a dolphin? Nobody does that with whales. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den and they shall not hurt or destroy in my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In the new earth there will be restoration of all plants animals, and insects to their full glory. On the new earth, T-Rex, back. Megalodon, back. Two-foot dragonfly, back. Titanoboa, 50-foot snake, 2,500 pounds, ready for a hug. (laughs) Ancient giant scorpions, back. Mega crocodiles, back. Giant otters, they're back. There's one I didn't show you, but it was so good. So uh, they call it Radzilla. And so based on the fossils, it's in the rat family, (laughs) but it's 10 feet long and it's got an extra five foot tail. If God were here, he'd be like, you're welcome, it's extinct. Could you imagine that running through our cities? (laughs) And every species reflecting uniquely the glory of God, the nature of God, the character of God, the creativity of God, the heart of God in every single species made. And we have the rest of eternity to play and to explore. Ready for a bit more imagination? You ready? You remember in C.S. Lewis, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, there are talking animals. You know why he put that in there? Now, I'm not gonna claim to know what's gonna happen. I'm just gonna tell you why he did it. In the Garden of Eden, uh, it says, I mean, you have a snake corresponding with humans. That's weird. And then it says he was craftier, smarter than all the rest of them. And then he was cursed. Now, I have no idea what it's going to look like. But his idea was, what if, what if when they are recreated to their original glory, they had intellectual and physical capacities that we have no idea about? What if God actually, in the fall, subjected them to a level of futility because of how evil humanity would be, because of how cruelly we would treat them, how quickly we would kill them? And so in order to protect them, he subdued their conscience and made them brute animals. And he surmised what might their glory be like in the resurrection. I have no idea. I'm not going to pretend to know, but I appreciate his imagination rooted in the word of God. In the new creation, there will be restored access to the tree and to the river of life. Revelation 22, 1, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal. Like, uh, only thing I can imagine is that the glory of God is flowing through it, and this is the best description that he has. Bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kind of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. I was, I was driving, uh, I think it was last night or the night before, and I was thinking about this text in particular. And I was imagining like it's January and there's a certain kind of fruit on the tree of life. And all month long, this fruit is so amazing. Like imagine it's an apple, but it's the best apple you have ever had. And so you're eating from the tree of life and then all of a sudden February comes and it's oranges. And you're like, these are the greatest oranges. And you can't wait till January because you get to eat the apples, but you're not actually discontent because every single month is a new surprise. And I just, I imagine all of the ways that God is going to delight in delighting us. All of the moments where we're like, no way, I had no idea. That's amazing. That's so clever. Oh, it's so good. If future us could come back and talk to us today, resurrected us, like he would have, she would have a lot of words to say to us. Like, just wait. It is going to be so much better than anything you can possibly imagine. And no water is going to be more satisfying. No fruit more enjoyable, no healing so complete, no place so pure. It will be a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness reigns. 
So I'd like to tell you, again, you're welcome because I have about three hours of teaching on this. And uh, last week I kept you for a very long time. So I want to jump to our so what's and we'll go deeper over the next two weeks. I want to launch from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. As Peter just considers the reality of the future, here's what he says. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. So what, number one? Wait with holiness. There, there are two sides to holiness, and, the, and one is obvious, and I want to be a broken record again. One side of holiness is Submitting your actions under the authority of God's word with a good motive. Like choosing to do what you know God wants you to do. And holiness is about behavior. And let me just say this again and again. One day you will die and you will be judged and you will be rewarded. And if you could come back in that moment and talk to you today, you would tell yourself, Live for Jesus at every moment. He will make it worth your while. And you will probably have some level immediately of regret for all of the moments that you did not obey when you knew you should have. And you're not gonna regret it because you're gonna pay for it. You're gonna regret it because you will see that God will measurably reward every single act of faithfulness in eternity that you do now. Every moment where you say no to your flesh, you say no to lies, you choose to believe him and take him at his word, you choose to do the hard thing for the sake of Jesus, you will be rewarded wonderfully. There's another side to the equation though, which is the attitude of the heart. That you can have somebody do the right thing with like a begrudging motive. But I think there's another aspect of holiness here which is so important. And that is that your attitude would be rooted in gratitude. That the grateful heart is a holy heart. And, and can I just, let's get like sort of weird for a moment. When I say that, you know it's gonna get weird. But it was a while ago. I don't even wanna put time to it. It was a while ago. I was in bed and I had this thought. It, it took a hundred years of engineering technology to get this bed to where it is this comfortable. And I thought to myself, every time I get in my bed, I'm like, this is so wonderful. And then I'm sleeping on literally some of the greatest sheets from some of the best cotton history has ever known. Perfectly woven together. And if it gets a little bit too dirty, we can go wash them, put them back. Everything's happy. And then I was thinking about, like, I have the perfect amount of sheets. And they're so comfortable. And my pajamas are more comfortable than, than really probably anything the kings of old ever had, right? We, we just live amazing lives. And then I thought to myself, my house is regulated to the perfect sleeping temperature. And then I'm sitting there and I'm like, I want a fan. So I turn on the fan above my bed. Not, not enough. So I turn on the fan next to my head. And then I think, it's a little too quiet in here. I want some white noise. So I turn on my white noise machine. Then I lay my head down on my pillow that, again, is about 100 years of manufacturing and engineering genius, like perfectly made for my head and my neck so that I have the most wonderful night's sleep in all of human history. And sometimes, just for kicks, we'll throw a weighted blanket on because it feels like you're giving a big hug as you go to bed. I'm too hot. Let's, let's turn the air conditioning on just a little bit. I mean, literally, it is perfect. And then for those nights you can't sleep, let's get some melatonin. That'll help me go right out. Guys, this is like the tip of the iceberg. Try this little experiment. Count how much money you have on your body right now. What did you really pay for everything that is on your body now? Earrings, rings, clothes, shoes. For some people, you're like $15,000. We don't even think about it like that, do we? We have the most comfortable clothes. Like, we're going to go eat lunch, and it's going to be awesome. You're, collectively, we're going to eat cuisines from all over the world right at our fingertips. And we complain. Don't get me wrong. Life is really hard. It's not just creation longing and groaning for the recreation. It is our souls and our bodies. Death and decay are everywhere. But God in his grace to, to non-Christians and to Christians gives us these moments of enjoyment. This ability to enjoy life. And I think the Christian who is able 
to give God glory and thank him. Like the, the default prayer in the back of our heads should be thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're driving unbelievable cars at awesome distances. We can go anywhere we want on a dime. Our lives are amazing and God's grace is everywhere. His kindness and his goodness, theologians call it common grace. It's the gift that he gives to all mankind everywhere despite our rebellion. How good has he been to us? And yes, we are longing, we are waiting, we are, we are anxious for this. But as a small gift, he has made this place a little bit bearable. And whatever you suffer, you're going to get there one day and you will say with Paul, it doesn't even compare. The glory that is about to be revealed to us doesn't even compare to the, the, the sufferings of this world are gonna be so small. But in the meantime, I think we give God so much glory when we live holy lives and we live lives with a heart of gratitude because our lives are unbelievable and amazing. So what number two? The good news is better than you thought. We don't trust in Christ to get more stuff this side of heaven. I mean, some people do. And if for some reason you trusted in Jesus and got richer immediately, I want you to know this, in all of human history, you are the vast minority. For the majority of people in history who come to Christ, their life gets harder. Their life gets more complicated. Things don't necessarily get easier. You get a big target on your back and the demonic realm hates you. And there's a lot of things that are actually pretty challenging as you trust in Christ. But I'm telling you, when you trust in Christ, you know this. You get complete and total forgiveness of sins. You get the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of you. You get the word of God who tells you all the mysteries of the universe. You get the people of God who most of the time love you really well. But you also get a recreated, renewed earth with every single species of plant, animal, and insects ever extinct to their original glory. You get full access to God in the most incredible capital city you would have ever imagined. The gospel is not you get out of hell. The gospel is also you have access to the new earth, confidence of it, and you will reign and rule with Jesus and creation will cooperate with you and you and angels and God will talk, surmise, plan, dream, create and play and worship for all of eternity. So you might be here and, and you have never even considered the implications of eternity. And I wanna take a moment and just encourage you, um, if you would love the confident gift of eternity, it will never happen in the way this world tells you that it happens. Everybody that I hear who is not reading the Bible is gonna have the same version of how you get there. Be good. How good is good? Better than the worst person that you know. You gotta be good enough. You gotta accrue works. And the Bible, thank God, doesn't say that. Salvation is for those who believe in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins and that he was raised from the dead and that he's coming back. Salvation is not for people who accrue good works, but it's for people who trust by faith that Jesus was good for them. And so I want to just ask you, maybe you were here, maybe somebody dragged you to church. Have you ever personally trusted in Jesus? Salvation is not by being good enough. It happens when you ask him to forgive you and to save you through Jesus Christ alone. And when you make that decision to trust in Christ, you get forgiveness. You get the Holy Spirit. You get all of the benefits. And then you have the absolute confident hope that this new earth and new creation will be yours to reign and rule on with Jesus forever. So we're gonna celebrate communion in a little bit and maybe you're here and you are ready to trust in Christ. And when we do, I wanna encourage you, partake of the elements with us and let this partaking be your first proclamation of your belief in Jesus. I wanna encourage you also, if you're ready to trust in Christ, would you come talk to one of us or somebody that you know who brought you? We would love to pray with you and encourage you and help you take your next steps as you grow in your relationship with God. Some of you are, are here and you're visiting from different churches. It's your first time here and you have personally trusted in Jesus. So when we do partake of communion together, I wanna invite you to partake with, of communion with us because what binds us together is not a building but Jesus. 
And so we're just thrilled that you're here and we get the opportunity to worship together. And in a little bit, we'll have a time of silence and we'll sing together. And, and during, this, during the time of worship, I wanna invite you, you can get up and get elements if you don't have them already. They're at that column to my left, the column to my right, and then right between the double doors in the back. You are welcome during the song to get up and, and get those. If you would hold on to those elements, we're gonna partake together at the end of the song. And we do this uh, as a symbol of our unity that is in, in Christ. And so let's have a time of silence. And my encouragement to you, as always, is yes, confess, but would you even spend some time just thanking God for every good gift that he has given you, especially the new earth to come? Let's talk to the Lord alone.